Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anne Conway. I'm the director of the Museum of Working Culture. And it is my pleasure to welcome you along uh, with Morgan Graff, who's the executive director of the Northern Historical Society, who also is um, sending her wave and welcome. Um, so it is um, amazing. We uh, only have, well, after this one, only one more Valley Talk. So we started in January. And um, well, luckily these um, Valley Talks have, have been around this year because many of us have been coming every, you know, every time and it's, they're just wonderful and certainly a great way to um, spend a, a pleasant hour when uh, we are so still so limited as to uh, the things that, that we can do. So um, thank you, Paul. And, and so we have some of our past speakers uh, with us today. And I, I wanna also thank you all for your, for your time. Um, the month of March is Le Mois de la Francophonie. Uh, if you are familiar with the Museum of Working Culture and our programs, you know that every uh, month of March we celebrate all things French. And um, this year we have many, many uh, programs. And um, I'm not going to go through everything, but I do want to highlight two of them because if we talk about French culture, we like to talk about food, right? It kind of comes together. So um, two of our programs involve food. And uh, the first one is we brought back our poutine indulgence and competition. So if you are familiar with poutine, it's this French Canadian Quebecois dish of French fries and kerchies and gravies. And um, we have um, seven restaurants throughout the state who will be competing for the best poutine. Uh, and you can purchase your, uh, so it's a passport. So in the past, when we could be together, we had the event at the museum and people could sample the poutine. So this year, you get a passport at the Museum of Working Culture. You can purchase your passport on shop mowc.com. We have different packages. Some of them include either one poutine, two, or you can get a whole package that will um, include a concert that we will have. Uh, it's going to be a live concert from Montreal on April 11th. And that's going to also be the day that we announce the winners of the uh, poutine competition. The concert is uh, by the group Midi Song. They, are, uh, they play traditional music in a very uh, contemporary way. So they're a great group and they're going to be performing live for us, for the Friends of the Museum of Working Culture. The other event that uh, I would like you to uh, take note of is our Cine Quebec event that is going to take place on March 18th. And uh, we're starting the event with a cheese tasting. So even though it's a virtual event, we're going to manage doing a real cheese tasting. Uh, and uh, for those who are registered, you will receive, you will pick up um, a uh, cheese uh, tasting package. Uh, and the, the cheese tasting is offered by uh, Edgewood Cheese Shop in Cranston. And uh, Adrienne, the owner of the store, will be joining us on Zoom. And as we taste the cheese and as we taste a little wine that's going to be included in your package, um, she will tell us about the different cheeses that we will be tasting. And then we are presenting a film called Grand Cru. It's a documentary film about a uh, Quebecois man who um, moves to France and he, he starts a, a vignoble, a, a wine um, I don't know how to say vignoble in English right now, but it'll come back to me. You know, he was started to make wine in France. Um, so, um, so that's it. Again, uh, shopmmwc.com if you are interested in joining us for these amazing events. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you my good friend, Paul Bourget. Uh, Paul is someone who wears many, many hats. Uh, some of you know him as a businessman, some of you know him as the chair of the Woonsocket School District um, School Committee. Um, some of you may know him as the past president of the Museum Foundation, uh, involved as uh, he was also the, um, the Grand Marshal of uh, the Autumn Fest uh, Parade a couple of years ago, I believe. Uh, and um, he is, uh, he volunteers at the museum 
to give us these amazing talks. And um, if you've been to some of his talks, he also is a Civil War reenactor. And you've heard him uh, talk to us about some of the battles that um, the General Sears Green was um, involved in. So um, Paul, I'm, going, I'm not gonna get into what you're going to be talking about today because that's what you're going to do. So I'm gonna turn the program to you right now, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, See if this works. Wow. Can everybody see the screen? Um, yes, we can, Paul. Okay, that's good to hear. Okay. This year's theme, for those of you who have attended um, the Valley Talks this year, you'll know that the, uh, the Historical Society's theme, we have a theme each and every year. This year is Taking a stand, I think that's the theme, staying at home and taking a stand. Uh, the topic that we're going to talk about, that I'm going to talk to you about today is the Sentinel Affair, uh, a period of five years that this, this, this event took place over a long, a long period of time. And the Sentinel Affair really pits two different groups of people uh, who took a stand, a religious stand, a uh, financial stand. It is the story of a group of Franco-Americans, French Canadians who immigrated to the United States and who lived in Woonsocket and who lived throughout the state and throughout New England, who took a stand against the, the bishops of their diocese, who took a, a stand against the use of uh, the bishops' use of parochial funds to build diocesan schools and to and for other diocesan projects. But to understand the Sentinel affair, you have to go back and take a look at where these French Canadians came from and what was important to them. And for those of you who have gone to the museum, right away as you walk in, there is a sign that speak, speaks of la survivance. Uh, la survivance really is the keystone to the French Canadians who live in, in Canada and to the French Canadians who came, who immigrated to the United States starting in around 1860 and right through the early 1920s. Uh, many, many uh, French Canadians uh, immigrated to the United States. Some found their way to, Can uh, to Woonsocket, others to Central Falls, West Warwick, some went to Detroit, some went throughout uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and so they spread out and basically they came to Woonsocket and other towns, other cities to work at the mills. Because in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a real financial economic crisis in the Quebec province. And so um, families could no longer afford uh, their, could no longer afford their farms. My grandfather packed up his family uh, and basically uh, gave his cows, his horses, his chickens, his dogs, everything to his neighbors and came to Woonsocket for the promise of work, for the promise of working in the mills. However, the survivance, which is really the trigger point, the, the, this is gonna be the keystone for the French Canadians who got involved in the Sentinelle, the Sentinelle affair. La survivance is made up of three different factors, language, faith, and traditions. The French Canadians believe that you have to keep your language strong, your French Canadian language strong, which would promote your faith and your traditions. It was vital for these French Canadians to maintain these three pillars, language, faith, and traditions, very strong. And they expected all French Canadians to maintain these three. And you can, this picture you see uh, is, a, is a woodcut that was prepared by Edmund Musicot, French Canadian in, in, who lived in, uh, in Quebec. Uh, and you, he, he came up with these nine pictures, nine to 10 to 15 pictures of different, uh, of village life. And here you see, this could be a celebration, a typical celebration on a New Year's Day. If there were carpets, they were rolled up uh, and there was violin, there might've been spoon playing, there might've been piano playing, 
and everybody got together and to celebrate family life. This was very, very important. As a matter of fact, if you go to the museum and you go upstairs to the three decker and you walk into that parlor, I call that Meme's house, my grandmother's house, because it looks just like Meme's house. That carpet would have been rolled up. The piano would have been playing all day, all night. Uh, there would have been a lot of dancing. There would have been a lot of eating. And of course, there would have been a lot of drinking uh, in those days. And maybe, who knows, maybe even today. So la survivance is very key. And here's, here's three other scenes from Massicot's uh, preparations. You see, the language is always French. And you see the grandfather sitting here uh, on his rocking chair. And that was important. Families lived together. Uh, you did not put anyone out. They were very religious. You can see a picture of the Sacred Heart here above the fireplace. And you just see a normal family life. So language, family is very important. This, the, the picture on the right, Preserve Faith, is a, is a, is a hood cut prepared by Masika. This is Midnight Mass. Uh, folks coming out of their local parish church, village church actually, uh, at midnight, after Midnight Mass. Now what's important to note about the French Canadian towns and villages, the pastor was probably the most important person in the town. He was the most educated, and frankly, all parochial funds were administered by the parish. The way the, the Canadian, uh, the provincial government worked and the diocesan uh, authorities worked in Quebec was that the bishop did not take parochial funds, did not, was not uh, the president of the parish corporation like he is here in Woonsocket and in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, each parish is a corporation. The bishop under the organization of Corporation Soul, S-O-L-E, that's how the diocese is set up. He is the president of the parish corporation. The vicar general is the vice president. The pastor is the treasurer and two lay trustees make up, uh, the round out the corporation structure of the parish corporation. As you can see, you have three clergy and two lay uh, individuals who run the parish. Uh, clergy outnumber them three to two, and that's intentional. So we may have a, over 130 parishes in the Diocese of Providence where the bishop is president, was president then, is president now of each corporation. Next is traditions, preserve, preserving traditions. Mussy cuts woodcut here. You see a man, the father of the family, the grandfather, extending his hands, his arms over his family, his kids, his children, and that's the that's the January first, the New New Year's Day blessing, the Father's Day. The fathers would give their blessing to their children as a tradition every New Year's Day. Matter of fact, as I recall, my my family speaking often of New Year's Day being the most important of the holidays. It wasn't Christmas; it was New Year's Day, for all the traditions, the the Father's blessing, and I think uh, there was a lot of eating and drinking as well. I think there's a lot of eating and drinking and all these things. So that was very important. French Canadians, as I said, came to Woonsocket and they came to work at the mills. And you see some of the two of the largest mills here in Woonsocket. Uh, Woonsocket was a French, became a French Canadian town. Uh, by the early 1900s, uh, you, the, the, the city probably had 70% of its, of its citizens as French Canadians. And what's interesting is you could be born in Woonsocket, you could be raised in Woonsocket, you could go to school in Woonsocket, you could get married, you could live a good life, have a nice job, have kids, and die without ever speaking a word of English. The French Canadian stronghold, especially the social corner, the area of Cumberland Street, Clinton Street, Social Street, and anything behind it, uh, right through Elm Street, et cetera, all that area, what was considered social, the social district, the social ward was very French. If you own the business in, in Woonsocket, guess what? You better speak French. And they did. Uh, and so French was, was very uh, predominant during this period. And of course, as the families kept coming in, 
St. Charles, which had been the Irish, the only church in Woonsocket, the Irish church, uh, the Irish Catholic church, well, the French Canadians needed churches. And so they built Precious Blood, which is the church on the left, which was the uh, mother church for the French Canadians. And as the families kept coming in, they needed something, they needed another church. And so they built St. Anne's. And the picture to the right is St. Anne's Church. And that's the background you see uh, behind me. Uh, sitting here is a picture of, of the, the inside of the church. And the building here, although the parish was formed in 1890, uh, this parish, the parish church, the beautiful uh, church with the two towers was built in 1913 to 1918, basically with the nickels and dimes of its parishioners. So now we're setting the stage as we're getting into the 1900s. After World War I, there was a great movement in this country for nativism, which means any foreigners were not exactly welcome, whether it was the Irish, the French Canadians, anyone. Uh, World War, well, after World War, II, uh, World War I, a lot of, of our French Canadians who fought in the war couldn't understand English. That was a problem. And then in 18, we have the Russian Revolution or the Red Scare. And so now the country was really moving to assimilate all languages into English. The Catholic Church and the Catholic bishops were worried about this because they knew that it was very important to maintain languages and maintaining Catholicism in, 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 the, uh, in the United States and in their diocese. And so what they did was they worked very hard with the, with the congregation of bishops to form a catechism, uh, which was basically in English. Well, there was a few couple of, uh, and of course this went right to the state house. The Peck bill, which was introduced in the early 19, uh, late 1900s, early 1920s, and the smith turner bill were to, their aim was to reduce French uh, taught only as a subject. All other, it would be a French subject in school. All other subjects, math, science, history would all be taught in English. And so there was a real stranglehold on the French Canadians uh, and very difficult pressure placed on them to, uh, to get rid of it. They needed, they worked very hard to keep their French language. And so what happened was, in the early 1920s, a secret society called the Order of the Crusaders, L'Ordre des Croisiers, was formed. And many of the more important elite members of the community, including uh, left to right, Elie Vizina and Eugène Jalbert, those two men were part of Union Saint-Jean-Baptiste, which was a, a fraternal organization, many organizations that promoted the French language, the French traditions, the French faith, as well as selling insurance to French Canadian families. And, of, and to the right of all of them, to, to both of them is Elfege Daniel, who was a probate judge, an attorney who had been educated in Canada, who had very, very strong feelings and uh, regarding la survivance. And, and they also garnered support from the local clergy uh, throughout the city, many other cities also joined in, and Lord de Croisi really went to the uh, to the state house and really worked hard uh, to uh, to just dampen the effects of the Peck Bill. The Peck Bill was voted in, but it was never ever instituted. So the French Canadian schools, the bishops, the Catholic schools were not touched uh, as a result of what Lord de Croisi. Uh, they, they, they had a lot of influence in the state house. Like I said, the other bill was the Smith Towner bill, which again would have gotten rid of, uh, it would have formed the American Education Society. Uh, uh, it would have been a secretary in Congress. And frankly, the control of all schools would have been placed on the federal, under the federal government. And now to really force the assimilation of all foreign languages into English. Um, so the states would lose control over their schools. They would lose a lot more controls over just how they would be, uh, kids would be educated. Um, education would be taken out of the hands of the, of the parents and would be not even uh, left with the state or the Catholic bishops or the public schools. It would have been handled out of, uh, out of the federal government. And that never took hold. 
As I mentioned, the National Conference of Bishops really worked together in those early 1920s to come up with the Baltimore Catechism. Those of us who went to Catholic school uh, might have suffered a couple of whacks on the knuckles from uh, certain rulers, certain nuns. You learned this catechism. Actually, the Baltimore Catechism was actually translated into French, which is kind of funny because the whole idea of the Baltimore Catechism was to really assimilate uh, Catholics of all languages into English. Before we get to the Bishop's Fun Drive, let me, let me, uh, let's go to William Augustine Hickey. Bishop William Augustine Hickey is the third Bishop of the Diocese of Providence. He followed Bishop Matthew Hawkins who followed uh, Bishop Thomas Hendrickson. Bishop Hickey is probably one of the best administrators the Diocese of Providence has ever had. Well-educated, uh, as Ray Bacon was saying before the meeting, uh, Bishop Hickey was a pastor in, in various parishes. And one of his, one of his uh, avocations was, the, was the, the French language. He loved to practice French. He loved uh, the French language. Um, he, was, he was very intelligent, uh, a very good businessman, uh, frankly. He had a great business mind. And because he knew French, he was appointed the third bishop of Providence. And this bishop was not exactly the warm, fuzzy kind of person. Uh, that's him smiling right now, looking at us. Look how, look how, look how happy he looks. This was, uh, this was after he was asked to smile. Uh, bishop Hickey was all business uh, and was gonna run uh, his diocese for close to an iron fist. It was his way in Norway. Um, his his uh, priests, uh, many of them feared him uh, many of them worked hard to please him, uh, but it, he was a very difficult individual. Well, in early 1920s, we have all this assimilation going on, and Bishop Hickey decides to institute a fund drive, the Million Dollar Drive, 1922. He decides to, to uh, assign goals of, uh, to each parish. Each parish had, to, had a quota, uh, and if they didn't meet the quota, guess what? the funds would be taken out of the parish treasuries. Uh, this did not sit well uh, with, uh, with uh, Elphage Denio and other members of St. Anne's Parish. And that's why you see the St. Anne's Parish Church in my background. This is, the, this is where the Sentinel affair begins. And so Elphage Denio and his, and his group of French Canadians were ob objected to Bishop Hickey's fund drive. Their whole intent was, Bishop, these are parochial funds. These funds should be used by the parishes to, to, for their own projects. You see, St. Anne's was in the, in the process of, get, of uh, raising money to build their own high school. And they wanted to build it where uh, the, uh, the baseball park was across the uh, street from, Woonsocket, from Landmark Medical Center, which is, you've got, uh, you know, uh, that, that strip mall of doctor's offices and uh, uh, Koch I think is in there now. Uh, but that whole area was a baseball field. It was an open field. And so they were planning on building a high school there. And of course that was nixed as a result of the events that are gonna happen now. Uh, so Bishop issues a, a fund drive, a three year drive to raise a million dollars for all parishes who had a quota and if they didn't meet the quota, if the parishioners did not raise enough money, well then the, the, rem the amount that they were short would have to be paid by the parishes. What the, the funds were going to be used for was to build Mount St. Charles, which ended up being built in 1924, and they were gonna expand and improve LaSalle Academy. They were also gonna build St. Ray's uh, in other Catholic school, uh, high schools in the diocese because the bishop was right. You know, if we're going to protect our faith, our language, uh, not our language, but our Catholicism, we got to make sure we got enough high schools because, again, faith was being challenged as well. The Ku Klux Klan was raising its ugly head in the early 1920s as a result of assimilation. There was a great movement to assimilate everybody into English. Um, and so many bishops throughout the country were, were looking to build high schools, Catholic high schools. Uh, that, would, uh, that would be fed by the local, the parochial uh, grammar schools. In Woonsocket, 
Monsignor Charles Doré was the founding pastor of Precious Blood Church. He was very popular uh, amongst his flock. He was well known to the bishop and the bishop liked him because Precious Blood Parish became probably the, one of the biggest donors of, uh, of the Catholic charity drive. Um, and of course, his committee met with the bishop often uh, and they raised enough money uh, to build Mount St. Charles along with certain diocesan loans and uh, with other grants. Mount St. Charles was built in 1924. The group that opposed the bishop was very upset with this high school because again, French was going to be relegated to a course, French. Uh, and religion was also gonna be taught in French, but all other, all other subjects were gonna be taught in English. Now, the problem with that, and they brought in, Mount St. Charles brought in French speaking teachers. But the problem is if, you, if a student learns math in English, science in English, history in English, you go home to do your homework, and, you have, and many times you're gonna be doing homework with your fellow students, what language have to you, do you have to speak? You're gonna speak English. So more and more, you're gonna be speaking English. And so the families, the French families would see the French Canadian language, the French language diminish over time. And this was not uh, a good thing for uh, this group of uh, sentinels. And we're gonna, and as you know, a sentinel is a guardian. And the sentinel movement, the sentinel affair is named after the newspaper that Elphage Daniel will create in 1924 called La Sentinelle. And La Sentinelle began as a daily newspaper. And later on, because of funding issues, they would become a weekly paper. But its intent would be to attack the bishop, it's, it's the bishop and his followers and his supporters at every single, every single chance they got. But here we are in 1924, Mount is built. And here's Bishop Vicky again. And so we get to something called the fork in the road. The order of the, of the crusaders had been, had been one group that fought assimilation. But now we have a group of sentinels uh, who are all St. Anne's parishioners, and, that, and this was growing now, this was starting to grow, not only in St. Anne's Parish, but it was leaking to St. Louis Parish in Woonsocket. It was leaking through all the parishes. It was leaking to, uh, it was expanding to Notre Dame Parish in, in Central Falls, par parishes in Warwick, in West Warwick. There was a problem here. So the French Canadians at this point, they agreed that they wanted to keep the French language, faith and tradition strong. But there, the two groups, the, there were two groups now, the moderates who supported the bishop and the militants who were sentinels had two approaches and they're here. The militants believed that language was first followed by traditions and then faith because faith would only be kept if their language and traditions were kept strong as it had been in Canada as it continued to be done in Canada. Let's remember this highway, the highways, the roads that led from the United States to Canada were wide open. And many uh, French Canadians who are now Franco-Americans went back to Canada to visit family and friends. Canada was always their hometown, their home country uh, for the longest time. I mean, you spoke of America and you spoke of Canada, you spoke of Quebec still happens today. There are people who see Canada as a strong tie and it's almost an umbilical cord that ties Canada to the United States, especially if you're French speaking. It continues today. I mean, I can't tell you how many times my family and I went to Canada, drop of a hat, five, six, seven times a year on those lousy roads when I was a kid. It was a strong, strong tie. So language and traditions to the militants were paramount which would, would, would allow you and promote your faith. The moderates, on the other hand, since they were really strongly supporting the bishop, faith was paramount, then traditions, then your language. Language was last. Keeping your faith was the most important thing you could do. 
Most of the clergy in the province, in the uh, diocese of Providence, supported the bishop. There were there were two notable exceptions: Father Joseph Bellin of Notre Dame Parish in Central Falls, and Father Achille Achilles Prince, Prince, who was the pastor of St. Louis Parish here in Woonsocket. Those two. Uh, priests were thorns in the bishop's side. Talk about you know, antagonizing the bishop. Uh, they did an incredible job over the five years. We'll talk some more about that. Parishioners were divided. I do a lot of valley talks on the Civil War, as Ann mentioned and Sarah has mentioned. I, I'm, a, I'm a Northern general. I portray a Northern general. And as you know, during the American Civil War, brother fought against brother, neighbor against neighbor, state against state. And folks were divided and they were in their, in their division and what they believed in were people held very strong opinions and they acted on those opinions. Well, that's what we have here. Families were divided. Some were for, some members of the family might be for the bishop, others were for the sentinels. They did not, they agreed with the sentinels that parochial funds raised by parishioners should be used for parish projects, not for diocesan projects, period. Uh, the whole idea of these Catholic schools built by the bishop uh, would assimilate uh, uh, children into the English language where faith, where uh, language and traditions would be lost. And so this was a, a, a very large division. And my family, my mother's side, they were moderates. My father's side, were sentinels. Uh, and as you can imagine, and, and if you went down into any shop or any, any store, any movie house, any, wherever you went to a park or a picnic, you found sentinels and you found moderates. And sometimes you had a lot of heated arguments throughout the city, not only here in Woonsocket, but now it was expanding uh, throughout New England. The fraternal organizations that we spoke about, the Order of the, of the Crusaders, L'Union Saint-Jean-Baptiste, there, there was another one, the American Canado Association, which provided, again, support for language and traditions, as well as insurances for the French speaking people. All of these were divided. Some were moderates, some were sentinels. And so now people ch had chosen a path. You had moderates and militants. To the left here, you have the moderates. Vizinot, Jalbert, Boucher, who was the editor of that tribune, the mayor of the city, Adelaide Soucy, uh, who's related to our own David Soucy, were moderates. They supported the bishop uh, very strongly, the La Tribune, uh, the French speaking, the other French speaking, uh, French written uh, newspaper. Uh, really supported the bishop in all ways. The mayor did too, Union Saint-Jean-Baptiste. And then on the right, you had the Sentinels. Elphege Daniel was the editor of La Sentinelle, the chief proponent of the, of the movement. You had Fidzim uh, who was who was really the spokesperson. He did a lot of the speeches for the Sentinelists. Dr. Gaspar Bouchier, dentist, who was very, very involved. And the organist of St. Anne's Church, Emil Brunel, would go along with the Sentinels when they went all over the uh, New England giving speeches. And he would play the piano uh, and uh, different music, patriotic music, uh, to entertain uh, the crowd uh, in between speeches. And I kept the one at the bottom, uh, uh, Albert Foisy. He was an interesting character because he began as the redactor at the Sentinel. He was a Sentinelist. But as the newspaper became more and more militant, more attacks on priests and the bishop, he just said, I've had enough, I can't do this. And so he became, he went over to La Tribune and became a staunch supporter of the bishop, wrote a book on La Sentinelle, he called it The Sentinel Affair, while Daniel also wrote a book down the road and it was called The Movement of the Sentinelle. So you have a movement and you have an affair. One was very negative, the other was very positive towards the Sentinelists. So they, so you can see some of the more important folks were divided. You had a divided clergy as well. Bishop Gerton uh, from Manchester 
was attacked by the Sentinelists, and he was the only French Canadian bishop at the time in all of New England. He was attacked. Father Monsignor Doré was a strong supporter, and I put up Father Camille Villiard, uh, pastor of St. Anne's here at the lower left. I can't even imagine how he, how he handled this because he was the pastor of the parish where the Sentinel movement began. You can imagine the grief the bishop gave him and how much grief he took from his parishioners because he had moderates and he had Sentinels living right under his roof. The Sentinels had a strong link to Canada and they really uh, got advice from canons. A canon uh, is, a, is, a, is a, a Catholic lawyer involved with canon law. And they supported many of them, including this uh, canon Gignac, Master Gignac, supported the Sentinels and said, you have the right to do this. You have a right to oppose your bishop. You're doing the right thing. And they got that kind of, of uh, support. The Sentinels got a, a lot of support from uh, bishops, canons out of Canada. Um, and so they they felt that they had a good they had they were well supported and they had a they had a lot of justification to continue the movement. I mentioned Father Bella and Father Prince, uh, who were basically the top two priests, the two priests that really uh, fostered the Sentinel movement. Uh, they wrote constantly to the bishop to relent to let the parishes run their own financial affairs. Of course, the bishop would not, wouldn't hear any of it. And as the bishop kept calling them into, uh, <laughs> into Providence for meetings, they were never, they seldom showed up. They were always going to the doctor. They were always unavailable. It drove the bishop crazy. Uh, and they did this for a good five years. And at some point he will remove uh, Father Prince uh, from St. Louis. And he wanted to remove uh, Father Benham, but you know what happened? Benham would not resign. He refused to. He was asked five, six times to resign. He just didn't do it. Um, and so the bishop actually um, treated his parish as vacant. He, he, he pronounced it vacant, which means I don't care if you resign or not, you have, there's no pastor here. And, and he was going to admonish him further, but Father Benham died uh, in 1929 from a bad heart. Father Prince also died uh, from a sickness in 1929. This movement, this affair really uh, affected people uh, very seriously, health-wise, phys uh, uh, physical-wise, also their reputations. We are in 1920s. And I just wanna mention that for us Catholics now, we find ourselves in churches that are almost empty. We can't, there are no, vo, very few vocations. The nuns are basically gone. Uh, prayer life is, is very minimal. And so we have a different faith now. In the 1920s, if you were a Roman Catholic, that was your entire life. You lived, you, you spent a lot of time in church, in prayer. Uh, you had this, you were in awe of your priests. Uh, you really treated them like royalty. And so if you were threatened by your bishop or by your pastor uh, that could endanger your immortal soul, you took heed and you listened very carefully to what they said. It's a whole different time in the 1920s than it is now. And so we move on. The Sentinelle, the newspaper I just showed you, I had just the front page, really was used to promote the cause of the Sentinelists. And it became very militant from 1925 on. The Sentinels spent a lot of time communicating and visiting Cardinal Pietro Fumasandi Biondi, the, the apostolic delegate in Washington. This poor man was besieged by the Sentinels and by the Bishop of Providence both fighting for their own causes. The bishop trying to uh, really wanted to sanction the Sentinelists and really bring them all kinds of grief while the Sentinels wanted the bishop to stop this drive. Actually, they, they asked for his resignation. 
They wanted to take their case to Rome. They wanted to get rid of this bishop who just didn't understand them. Uh, and so this was a constant tug of war. Uh, the moderates and the sentinels with the apostolic delegate. And actually this case will even go further into, in, into Rome. It'll reach the, uh, the gates of Rome. This is another uh, front page. The headline is Quimange du Prêt Amar. Means if you eat of a priest, you're gonna die from it. In other words, you attack priests you are endangering your immortal soul. That was a quote that came from uh, the moderates. And so Deng Yu and, oops, and Himo, who was the co-leader of the movement, uh, really objected to anything the bishop uh, said. They really believed in their cause and they, they began in 1925, so from 25 on, to give these incredible speeches at Cass Park at Joyland, for those of you who know the Dion, uh, Dion track, that's where Joyland was. Right before that, that entire parking lot from Hokong all the way to the track, that was uh, uh, Joyland's uh, roller skating rink, uh, which burned down. I hated that place because I couldn't skate and I kept falling down. So when it burned down, Paul was very happy. At, but I did not set that fire, let it be known. Uh, so, Joyland would fill four to 5,000 people, believe it or not. And there were people outside <clears throat> listening to the speeches. They went to Cass Park. They went to St. Louis Park. They went everywhere they could to hear the Santinas speak. They went to St. Anne's Park, which was the ball field, uh, where, uh, which is across, was across the street from uh, Landmark. It was a ball field at that point, And they would hear speeches there. They gathered, the sentinels would gather on Social Street and one of the floors was a hall owned by a Mr. Denevay. And they met there weekly. Uh, people in Woonsocket would see people walking from all over the city to go to this meeting, to the meetings that Santanez held. And here you can see different rallies. Uh, you see one at St. Anne's Park. You see one uh, which is right here in the middle and then uh, Cass Park. Uh, which is to the right, where they had thousands upon thousands. Uh, one time at, at, Saint, in, at Cass Park, they had over 10,000 people listening uh, to, the, uh, to the Sentinels. And June 24th was always their big day. June 24th is Saint Jean Baptiste Peace Day, the patron saint of Canada. I think it, it's not Canada, it's at least Quebec. Uh, and so they were, the city had parades. Uh, you had masses, high masses. There was always a picnic. There was, a, there was an evening dinner in one of the major halls. There were patriotic speeches. Um, this went on from the early 1900s, well into the 1920s. In 1925, Bishop Hickey banned all parishes to close their halls and there would be no masses uh, offered uh, uh, for the Sentinels at all. And so the Sentinels had to at least two of their the priests that followed, supported them, and they would hold the mass out in uh, out, uh, out in the fields. They did that because they they would would not be denied their traditions. In 1926 to 27, uh, the Sentinels decided to strike the pew rent. Now, for those of us who remember the pew rent, uh, you can take a look at the picture below. You see a man holding a box, which has indented circles for coins, and then there's a place to put bills. And so as, they, as you sat in your pew, they would go by and ask you to pay a quarter for you to sit there in the pew. It was called the pew rent, la place de bain, for those of us who remember that term. And so uh, altar boys would go by, would be with that man, the collector, and he would dump periodically money into your basket and you went on. And then there'd be a second collection for the budget. You see the man with, with a closed fist. That's to show you uh, just a, sim a symbolic representation of the strike. Many parishes uh, employed the strike. And of course that per parochial funds. And so now we were getting serious. If you're, gonna, if you're going to deny the bishop or the pastor his pew rent, things were really gonna be shaking up. The bishop is not relenting. The bishop is not giving in. He refuses to. The Sentinels will not back down. 
these two groups uh, were at each other's throat. So in 1928, under the advice of the canon lawyers, Elfej Daniel and the Sentinels decide to sue the bishop over the use of the parochial funds. 10 parishes uh, 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 will be represented in this suit. Five members of the parish will sign the petition to bring the bishop to court. It's going to superior court. Now, the judge that's sitting on the bench is Judge William Tanner. The diocesan lawyers argued unsuccessfully that this is a church matter. There's no, there's no reason to have a suit brought to civil courts here. This is a Catholic church matter. It's religious separation of church and state. No, 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 says Judge Tanner. That's not true because each parish is a corporation under, that was established under the laws of Rhode Island. And so they, the Sentinels have the right to bring loss, a lawsuit against the bishop's authority, especially as he is the chief operating officer of every single parish. So the 10 parishes were, uh, were, were included in the suit and there, was a, there were a, a number of about 60, 61 people uh, that, were, that signed up, uh, that were listed in the petition. On the canon law, you can't sue your bishop. You sue your bishop, you get excommunicated. The bishop wanted to excommunicate them right away. And, however, the apostolic delegate basically told him, no, don't do that, wait. Wait and see what happens. And so the lawsuit is progressing through 1928. And of course, the, the, uh, the Sentinel drums are beating louder than ever. Uh, Dengu and his followers are going throughout New England, giving speeches. Uh, and again, the Bishop Hickey is writing to all the bishops in, in New England. He's writing to bishops in uh, Canada. He's writing to Rome to have them stop, to stop the, their priests wherever they may be, to deny them access to their, to their uh, halls, to their churches, to stop uh, supporting the Sentinel movement against the, the authority, the, you know, the Episcopal authority of the church. It kept on. So the, as the uh, lawsuits, the lawsuits continue, uh, in 1928, Daniel takes his case, hold on a second, all right, let's do this. It goes on to 1928. And frankly, what happens is the judge comes back and says they have the right to sue. However, the bishop has the right to, to use parochial funds because we're talking about the church, the Roman Catholic church, the large C church not the parish church, the small c. Uh, since the bishop has the authority, the Catholic authority over these, over these people, over these corporations, he is allowed on the corporation soul to use the funds. And so the Sentinels who had the right to sue lost the suit. And so now this matter was being taken to Rome. On Bishop, sends a, a delegation to Rome ahead of Daniel, who is going to Rome for the second time to fight for his case. While he's in Rome, the excommunication order is granted. Bishop can excommunicate anybody who sued him. And later on in 1929, I, I just want to put his picture here, probably the, the most respected uh, supporter of La Survivance in Canada, Henry Adi Bourassa will write five articles denouncing the Sentinel movement. And that will be the kiss of death for the Sentinel movement. When the biggest supporter of La Survivance and French, and French nationalism tells you <laughs> that your movement has no cause and should stop, uh, that's, that's the bitter pill to take. I wanted to show you uh, just a picture that I received from Donald Hoyd, who helped me write the uh, 
this, the uh, history of St. Anne's Parish in Woonsocket. We see here Elphage Daniel and his wife looking very happily on their cruise to Rome. Look how happy they look, how incredibly excited they are to go to Rome by way of France, where they met with some of the uh, uh, probably canons and bishops that they wanted to meet with to support their, their, uh, their cause. Obviously, he will learn in Rome that the uh, sacred congregation of the doctrine has ruled against him. 61 people were excommunicated by the Bishop of Providence. And here's a list of them. Five from St. Anne's, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. Two were, two priests, uh, two, two individuals were put on interdict, uh, Father Prince, Antonio Prince, and Henry Perdrio, who had wrote, written articles against the bishop. But there will be 61 excommunicated. You got to remember, you've got to remember, if you're excommunicated in 1929, you're told that you are out of the church. That's a big deal. Not only that, they had a year to recant. If they didn't recant within a year, they would be deemed heretics. If you're a heretic in 1929, let me tell you, that means nobody can give you shelter, can give you food, can even, can even deal with you. You are outside the church almost forever and you are condemned to hell. That's pretty severe. That's worse than being put in the corner. Let me tell you, this is really a big deal. So uh, the Sentinels by, by June of 29 will recant. I put in a picture here, it was in French. All the Sentinels had to go to their parish church, kneel at the, foot, kneel at the altar rail, Representing the bishop would be the pastor and, and St. Anne's would be Father Villiard. And each, each uh, sentinel, former sentinel would have to write, uh, would have to sign his uh, recantation and would have to read it and be humiliated in front of the entire parish. And you can imagine that church was packed. Uh, 1,200 seats at St. Anne's at that time, they probably had 13, 1,400 people. Aisles were full, everyone was there. The, the Bishop of Providence celebrating his victory knighted eight individuals to the order of St. Gregory. A handful of priests, maybe six or seven or eight of them became on seniors because, because of their support. Other lay people who really wrote articles in favor of the Bishop uh, were, received papal medals. As we end this discussion of La Sentinelle, you have to stand back and as you read all the pages that are available on this subject, this affair was due and it, and it really was ratcheted up by two stubborn individuals, Bishop Hickey and Elphage Daniel. Those two men and their organizations would not compromise. That's why it went to the degree it went to. Um, there's an aftermath to this. Bishop Higgy will die in, 30, in 33. Monsignor Dore dies in 31. Daniel will die in 1937. A lot of the father, as we know, Father Prince and Father uh, Bellon died in 29. This had a bigger effect. But what really drives me on how important this whole affair was is that in Woonsocket, when Donald Horde and I were growing up, St. Anne's Parish in the 50s was dead. There was nothing going on. There was a weekly bingo. There'd be a, uh, maybe a party here and there in the, in, in the parish hall. And Ray Bacon can attest to this. Very little going on. We couldn't figure it out because as we were doing the history of the parish, St. Anne's Parish was the heart and soul of the social district. It was the entertainment center of the city. Uh, the the, uh, the St. Anne's gym had an opera house, had a bowling alley, uh, had a theater. It was very, very popular. It, it, it really was jumping and it died. And all my life, anytime somebody mentioned the, word elf, the words Elphage Daniel, you, you'd hear, shh, don't talk about that. And you always heard priests are always after your money. You'd always, people would look over their shoulders if you were talking about La Santinelle. 
And when I was interviewing folks whose family had been involved in Nasantinan, I had a person who shut her door, locked her door, brought the blinds down in her house and whispered to me and kept looking over her shoulder. I had, bishop, I had a bishop who said, I, I will not talk to you about this. I had other folks who very prominent French Canadians refused to talk to me about this movement because it was still alive and well in the hearts and minds of many parishioners. I was denied access to Bishop Hickey's diary uh, and to his notes, his archives. And we were told that a certain amount of generations would have to go before any of this would be made public until the last sentinel or family of the sentinel, so many generations would be gone before they'd be allowed. So we, I never saw his notes, but fortunately Father Heyman, the uh, diocesan archivist, was able to use those materials and write his book. Sentinel affair is, occurred in the 1920s. It was a militant approach to that, to the subject of the use of parochial funds. Unfortunately, that many of those sentiments are still alive and well today. Uh, hopefully peace can be found at some time in the future. Uh, but there we are. That's, that is the sentinel affair as best that I can do. And I'll open up the questions. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, there are a couple comments in the chat that I'm going to read to you. Um, the first of which says that Dr. Boucher's daughter is on the call and that she's 98 years old, um, but that she's here. Um, and then the other is that um, Camille Villard is my great uncle. My name is Camille after my aunt and him. He was the brother of my mother's stepmother, um, Florian Gavin. I will apologize to everyone if I'm not getting these pronunciations right as well. <laughs> um, so the first question is from James Clark, who asks, how much money did the bishop take from St. Anne's during this time? It was, it was anywhere from three to $5,000. Let's remember, this is 1920 money. It's a lot of money. Uh, when you consider, when you, you can't, you got to remember this is 1920s and St. Anne's was deemed a, a very poor parish. The church was built on loans uh, and on the collection of about $60,000 was raised by families uh, for years uh, prior to the building of the church uh, over a 10 year period from every kind of fundraiser that was held almost every week by every organization in the parish. So money was, uh, it's a whole different world, but about three to 5,000, probably every single, every single year over a three year period. So it was a lot of money, especially when that was to be used to help fund the high school. And it was, it was, it was not so much the amount of money as the intent is the reason why uh, the, uh, the monies were taken. Because if you can take money from a drive and, and, and assess a tax, what would, what would happen? Could the bishop take all the money? So it was, it was a very touchy subject. Anyway, that's the about, about the amount that was taken. Great. Um, and then I can see that there's a gentleman named Paul with his hand up. Paul, would you like to ask your question? Yes, hi, Paul. This is Paul Desjardins. Hi, the, hi, uh, Paul. Uh, long time no speak. I know. And hearing you, hearing you speak about Donald Horde, he and I hit a lot of baseballs together when I lived in St. Anne's Parish. Yes, you and, did. And uh, I remember you from school. <laughs> absolutely. Hey, listen, there's a family story that gets told in our Cody family about at one time, the proponents of the Sentinel movement had, um, at least as the story goes, locked arms to keep an Irish priest out of the rectory at St. Anne's. Have you come across that or is that um, urban he was, legend? And he was actually Belgian. This happened in 1914. Oh. It was called the Marist Affair. Uh, the uh, founding pastor of, of St. Anne's, Napoleon Leclerc, died in, nine, in 1914. And the bishop at the time, uh, Bishop Harkins, was going to assign St. Anne's Parish to a Belgian priest, uh, Father Flemons, out of uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Mass. French-speaking uh, man, 
very fluent French, had, uh, had been a pastor of a parish there, and they were bringing him in. Well, the people of the parish objected that what they wanted was a French Canadian. They don't want a Belgian. A Canadian. <laughs> they don't want anybody that doesn't know the traditions and the, uh, the traditions of, of the families. He's not one of us. We don't want him. So they, about two to 300 men would lock arms around the parish, around the, around the rectory, and police them with cars. They were not allowing anyone in until Bishop Harkins, uh, and guess who was in charge of that, uh, that group? Alphege Daniel. And he went oh. <laughs> with a committee to Bishop Harkins and finally Harkins, who was ill, capitulated and gave us Father, uh, Father Villiard and sent Father Plemons to uh, St. Saint, Saint Michael's in Providence and the pastor of St. Michael's, uh, Father Villiard came to St. Anne. But you're very right. Good. Thank you, Paul. Sure. Thanks for your homework. A really very in-depth uh, understanding uh, that you've given us today. Thank you very much. Nice work. Nice talking to you. A pleasure. All right. So we have a question in the chat that says, were whole families excommunicated? I only see men's names on the list. This is the 1920s. The only people who would sign the petition to, uh, ex to uh, sue the bishop were men. The bishop sued, uh, excommunicated only the signatories to those to the lawsuit. So it wasn't families who were excommunicated, it was just the individual. The Heman family, for example, uh, there must have been, they were all large families, eight, nine kids, six, six, seven, eight, nine kids. There were a lot of kids in that family. Only the father was excommunicated, kids him. So it was not families as a whole. This was this a very serious step. Church doesn't do this very often. And they and here they they excommunicate just the people who signed the lawsuits. Great. Um, our next question comes from Jim, who asks, "Is that a Brion suit? Yeah, is that a real? One? Is it a Brion suit? B R I O N N E." I have no idea what that is. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know. It's not a zoot suit I'm wearing. I have no idea. <laughs> if he's talking about a lawsuit. I don't know. <laughs> All I know is they sued the bishop in superior court. <laughs> uh, and Father Hammond didn't describe it as that. So I, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, Charlene asks if you are familiar with the Canadian TV miniseries, The Mills of Power, and if you feel like it is a fair representation of Franco-Americans during those years, including the Sentinel Affair. It's not even close. Uh, they make the deacon uh, the, uh, the villain in, in this story. It's not. Uh, the only thing you have is a, a, a bunch of actors, uh, let's say people who they represent uh, go against the bishop. No. The pouvoir, you know, I, I know this movie. I've seen it and I was disappointed. No, it's not even close. Okay. Um, Karen asks, if French Catholic high schools needed to be built, where were the children going to school before then? Did the Woonsocket churches have their own schools in their buildings? Many parishes in Woonsocket had a school. Um, that, was part of, that was part of the plan. Let's remember, and they were, they were following suit from what was happening in Quebec. In Quebec, uh, in, in, in the period of talking uh, the immigration time, it was, you know, the church wanted to increase its membership because it appeared that the English speaking Canadians were outnumbering the French speaking uh, citizens of the, of, of, of the province. And you, you probably know more about this, but pastors in the villages were encouraging families to have kids. And that continued when they came to the United States. Families were large. They would stack those kids on, in, they, they would get an apartment with four rooms and stack the kids in one bed like you can't believe. Uh, my grandmother had 20 kids, 20. My other grandmother had 11. I mean, where do you sleep? Uh, and how do you operate with one sink, one bathroom, no hot water? This is normal. Uh, and so, uh, very interesting times. Um, Dr. Boucher's daughter says that she remembers having to go to church in Bellingham because they could not go to St. Anne's. 
Um, and she also says that Dr. Boucher was a general practitioner, not a dentist. Okay. Um, and that's, and that's too bad. It really was sad that that happened. And it went to, uh, I believe they went to uh, Assumption. Assumption? Uh, the, the Bellingham Church was yeah. opened itself up to the Sentinels and to the moderates. Uh, it, was, it was a haven for Catholics uh, who were being picked on in, in Woonsocket. And so, yeah, I can, un I can understand that, but it was, it was, as you can imagine, this was- Father, was Dr. Do you to I think she can hear Go ahead. She can hear you if you want to talk. Yeah, to this is Madeline Gray, the Dr. Bush's daughter. Hi. Uh, hi, and my father was city doctor for Woonsocket for years and years. He was never a dentist. Okay, uh, I got it wrong. So- please, Yeah, please correct that. <laughs> Here's another Done. question. Did, did, uh, his I guess he removed other things than teeth. <laughs> what? He removed other things than teeth. That's what he said. Oh. Uh, teasing you. But yes. I never watched either one. <laughs> <laughs> did, uh, did Dr. Boucher's uh, being a city doctor for those years during that time, did his involvement in the Sentinel, did it affect his business and his practice in the city? No, no, it did not. Good. No, it did not because let's for many people, once this remember, if I would if I if you have to look at Winsocket as a whole, Winsocket and all the other cities wanted this affair, this movement to end. By the time it ended, people wanted this to be done. Uh, it, it 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 lingered in the hearts and minds, but it did not affect too many things. It did not affect the professionals, no, because he was well known as a as a as a good doctor. He was well known and well liked, so it did not. The people, I mean, the most of the anger and hatred was really aimed at Daniel because he was he was the uh, he was the leader. It would affect him more than anything, and he never stopped writing. Uh, giving speeches on La Santa, and uh, uh, he never stopped. He was always looking for every opportunity uh, to give speeches. When La Santa was put on the list, don't forget, when you're on the list, the bishop, the Catholic list, if you as a Catholic read it, you commit mortal sin. Remember those things? Remember those days when they had the movie list where if you went to an, uh, an R-rated movie, that could be a mortal sin if you sent your child to, to, to see those movies. They were on the list. Well, certain newspapers are on the list. So we, they changed the name of La Santinette to various, to various titles over the years. Guess what? They were all put on the list too. So no, it, it, Daniel, it was the name associated mostly with, with this movement. And like I said, if you mentioned that, his name, uh, you were told to stop it. You were told to keep quiet. I remember that very vividly. Okay, we have a question from Christian who's asking, how was little Rose Farron used in this affair and by who and why? She was not involved, as I, rec as I know, in looking at the history, uh, the case of Rose Farron did not involve the, the, uh, either the moderates or the Sentinels. Uh, I know Bishop Hickey visited her uh, I, I believe he prayed with her, but that's all I know, but it did not impact the Sentinel movement. Excellent. We have a few questions um, that I can answer asking about whether or not this um, has been recorded. The call has been recorded and the recording of it will be available on the Rhode Island Historical Society's YouTube page later this week. And everyone who registered will receive the link um, directly to that video so that you can share it. Um, Karen asks, I'm not Catholic, but just curious today, does the bishop still have the right to use parish money as he sees fit? We still have the Catholic chair. I'll answer it this way. Yes, the, the, he's still the president of the corporation. He pretty much leaves, lets the, par, the pastors uh, run their own finances, but they have to hand in an annual report. Uh, there's a there's a certain percentage tax to the to the parishes every year. Uh, during the Catholic charity drive, um, every parish has a quota, 
And there's a list prepared in the, uh, in the Catholic newspaper, the diocesan Catholic newspaper, to, here's how the parishes are doing. Um, in some cases, some parishes, I believe, have had to make up the differences. The poor parishes, no, because they don't have the funds anyway. But yeah, it's still, uh, that drive is still in force. Excellent. So it looks like those are all of our questions. Um, I'm going to post, whoops, if I can find her. I'm going to spotlight Anne again. Well, thank you very much for having me today. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Hopefully Paul. everyone did too. Thank you, Paul. It was really interesting as always. And um, if you have a um, more question as uh, you know, time goes by, please uh, email the Museum of Working Culture and we'll be happy to pass the questions uh, back to Paul. And um, I, again, I want to uh, remind you about all the great events that we have coming up. And uh, you can visit the Rhode Island Historical Society's website to see our calendar of events. And um, I wish you a great Sunday afternoon. The sun's shining. So hopefully everybody can go out and, and uh, get some fresh air. So bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.